coming in. Good evening. Is anybody out there? It's Thursday. We are live. What is it? Thursday, the 3rd of September. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Hello, Pansin. They're all coming in. Here we go. How are you all? Tina, hi, how are you in Austin? Our little family, our global family are drawing in. Do you notice how prompt I am? <laughs> Very British. <laughs> yes, I was actually reading, I'm reading this brilliant book at the moment. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? It was one that Chelsea moves uh, from, she, it's Native American writing and it's about uh, the right and the left hemispheres of the brain and um, how the left hemisphere of the brain is all our kind of keeping time function and the right side is the, is the feminine side, is the creative, artistic. I think I need to get back into my right sided part of the brain before I start writing. I think I'm too left sided at the moment. I'm trying to feel, am I more left, right? I don't know. Anyway, sounds interesting. All right. So um, I'm going to bring in, very lucky, I'm going to be talking to the extraordinary Paul Epworth. Probably the great kind of big producer of like the last, I don't know, decade. He's, he's lovely. I think we're going to have a nice chat. I hope so. Um, and I will try and get him in. It's not, oh, everybody's coming in. Sandra from Argentina. Hi, I'm, listen, I'm just going to say as well before I pull Paul in, um, I'm back on it now. Every week we're going to do this, apart from in two weeks' time, because I've got a reason. But um, back on it. Uh, um, yes, COVID dreams, crazy COVID dreams. Hello from the Ukraine. Um, yes, really, really strange dreams at the moment, um, but quite good ones, um, sleeping nicely. Hi, Lauren. Hi, everybody. These are all, this is the family coming in. Hello, Michael from Israel. Okay, here comes Paul. Other center request. All right, I'm going to bring him. I'm going to Paul, come in, 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 <laughs> come in, come in. Come in. Hey! How's it going? I'm all right, Paul. How are you? Isolation. <laughs> in isolation or not anymore, but we were, definitely. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to isolate from the family. <laughs> are, you, are you at home right now? Home, yeah, yeah. 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 How's it well, going? It, it's all right. How are you, how's it going for you? Is it, does it feel like a big day? You've got a single release today, right? I, do you know what? It does feel like a big one today, just because it's the first track of the record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, just, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Well, I've been enjoying your record on the, on the, on the, on the, on the only on the holiday I could find that I was in that quarantine from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a big thing, isn't it, bringing out a record? Like, it's like, uh, it's, you, you kind of, when you're working away in the studio, I mean, listen, first of all, congratulations, because I've heard it like twice now, and I think oh. it's, what, I mean, I think it's extraordinary. It's like, like oh. you described it as like a cosmic, <laughs> cosmic gospel disco, and it is. <laughs> and it's like, when I hear it, I'm like going, how the fuck do, I mean, how do you do that? How do you make that record? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot oh. of work in there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, the I had this crazy idea to to if if the, if the if the vocals weren't if I, if 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 it ended up as an instrumental record, yeah, I, you know, at least I'd done it. At least I'd really crafted it. So I spent ages linking all the tracks together. Yeah. <laughs> Which course... I love that. Listen, you know, what? I totally <laughs> love that. And I tell you what, I was really jealous because that's exactly what I wanted to do on my records. But by the end of it, I was so knackered. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like. I, I was I can't do this and I love I love all the segues on it and I, I'm definitely going to do that on my next record but like I listened to it and I went <laughs> yeah I was just like you, you you so saw it to the end yeah I'm almost I, I mean to be honest I think a lot of it's down to the Riley who works with me he's a he's my engineer and like there was a point at which I was like 
just it is what it is and that'll do and just yeah. go go and sit go and finish it he said you sure we don't want to listen to the masters like i can't <laughs> but it's like this i mean it's an extra i mean first of all it's it's a long it's quite long isn't it it's like yeah. what are we talk how long is it 50, 53 60 minutes or something yeah yeah i mean there's it's like there's so i mean it's extraordinary like there's so much going on in there it's not and it's not also i mean you've got tracks that have got less in it but there's and that you gave me the 360 mix, so I was listening to it on these. That's, that's quite fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man, can, uh, listen, I, you know, hats off, because... Oh, man, I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm, I'm really touched. But like, Seriously, are you going to, are you going to, I mean, are you going to take this live? Are you going to no, I mean? I'd love to, I'd love to take it live, and I think... Yeah. I think, when, like, I mean... All of us, you know, all, anybody who's who who wants to get the live thing going again, has, we've got we've got to think resourcefully, haven't we? Yeah. In terms of how we do stuff, and like, look, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm. I've always been when I was younger. I kind of enjoyed being on stage, and I was I was all right at it. But you know, at, at the age, the, the, you know, the grand old age, we, you know, I'm, I'm getting to. The, You're uh, younger than I am. <laughs> you don't look it. <laughs> It's it's a it's a definitely a, you know the idea of actually sort of setting out and doing all those sort of first shows the first you know first time feels quite daunting unless you can do it in a way that's really fresh and stimulating and yeah you no know, but you know you know like why you know maybe there's a situation in which you can do you know I mean the people like people are doing gigs in Fortnite that's a yeah that's another way that we can. I think, do you know what? I think the VR thing is really interesting and that's what I'm yeah. exploring at the moment um, is because, you know, it's not ideal, but there's something, if you could do VR, so I, you know, I said, it's not where I was, but I'm, I'm sort of talking to some people in America about this. Right. And, uh, and I got my managers on the case and they said, well, what kind of setting would you think? And my, I immediately was just like, okay, it's going to be cosmic. It's going to be... <laughs> You know, and your music, if there were visuals to it, if you had a live band playing, but they were kind of, you know, putting it on and flying through the universe, going through a wormhole. No, no. It's, it's that would be bonkers, wouldn't it? I know, I know. I mean, I've, I've kind of guessed that, you know, I mean, it's funny. I, I did, I, what my plan was that to try and do a 60 minute, a 60 minute sort of interpretive piece of, but you know, not not a movie, but a you know, a sixty minute. Yeah. Movie. So that it, so that it, there you would, you know, you didn't have to just sit, sort of sit and listen to it and let your imagination run free. But you know, that I, in hindsight, I wish I had actually pushed to do it because yeah. in, in the situation we're in, that, you know, that kind of that those the content's valuable, isn't it? In terms of it, in terms of being able to give people, you know, give people stuff that's just. Not just about the music. You, you you want to share the world that you that you feel it's part of, don't you? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because you 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 like. I mean, I. It's funny because I feel like real kind of um, similarity to that cosmic perspective. But it, you are when you make a record, you are you're you're providing an environment, a world, aren't you? That it. it that, yeah, you are. And you and you and and sometimes it's very obvious to you as the the creator and and people's own interpretations are just as important but also there are there are visual stuff that you want to share people the, the feeling of it where you're coming from yeah yeah i mean definitely we found we found this amazing animator sort of cgi animator a guy called kid mcgrath who was from argentina actually it was dilly who hooked us up well um, dilly jen and, yeah and uh, are you working and with dilly 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 hooked us up with him and then uh, wow. she so um through 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 a good, a good friend of mine shout out to peter drake um so uh, yeah he um and and yeah and so he he and he and he's just i mean i think from what i understand he's a sort of one-man operation he does all this stuff on his own you know you know in a in a in a in a, in a house in a, in a flat in argentina and uh and he's got you know and, and i mean i wouldn't even know where to start with making sort of cgi visuals especially as a one-man operation when that stuff is usually it's you've, you know it's incredibly considered incredibly like uh cost costly um but um they kind of yeah it's really uh yeah he's, he's done a, he's done a fantastic job and you know i think really brought the kind of uh the, the space thing to life um but it's it's funny because like the 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 the, the, the space thing was really more like a like a like a like a, the doorway in 
rather than that rather than j just about looking up at the stars and it was it was as much of a as a as a metaphor as a yeah. you know for for our you know where we are as a species and it's funny then the, you know having spent this long on the record yeah. And then to, to release it in the middle of a pandemic, when for you know half the world's population was under lockdown in, in, at some point in March. Yeah, you know. And uh, well, there must because you've been working. What well, you've been working on this? Yeah. Have you been working on this for like five years? Did you say? Yeah, about that. Yeah, I you mean, start, it's just in, in between so other things. But, there's um, something yeah. in the air, man, because it's that like I, I. It's so interesting because that cosmic perspective. My record, it wasn't just about that, but it's that. I think I told you that like um, it was so 20, 2013, it was sun, it was suddenly being aware of, 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 I think it was the pale blue dot. It was, it was, it was reading that and uh, seeing that image and the Carl Sagan and that perspective, that cosmic perspective, which suddenly was like, that for me was like the way into the record because, you know, you want to write something personal. You want to make something that yeah. feels that has to, but, I also, because of all the shit that's going on, you want to be in there, but you don't want to stay in that shit because I don't want, I want music to uplift me. And for me, every time, and it happens as well, when, yeah. I, get, when I get too embroiled in what's in front of me and, and the crap that faces us all and like <laughs> the overwhelming nature of everything, the thing that, that is kind of like my saving, the thing that I, I sort of want to bring, is like you pull back and you go, okay, what is going on? This is what's, you know, we are this tiny planet in a yeah. bus. I mean, I heard uh, Brian Cox on the radio today and he said there are, they said something like there are three trillion different galaxies out there and each galaxy has 800, around 800 billion stars, i.e. suns in it. So, I mean, yeah. we are just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I find that thing, that perspective really, really, uh, what is it? It's like... It, it, it really helps, but also it feels really important because yeah. that's the perspective we need as humanity. Yes, it is. Right yeah. now, instead of selfish pursuits. Oh my God! Yeah, and, I mean, and 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 these borders and these barriers and these things that we put up and they're excluded. I mean, you know, it is. So you look down on it, and you go like, I mean, really, are we that advanced? Yeah, yeah I know. And, and like, I mean, there's this the astronauts talk about this thing called the overview effect. You, yeah, you know, and like, I. I Totally, and it's that that, con that context of like. I mean, I, it, bizarrely, I had like I had a, I had a conversation this morning with Chris Hadfield, right? the wow. Canadian Canadian astronaut, and then, yeah, and I asked him about his first spacewalk. Yeah, and he and he uh, and he said it, it takes four hours to get the suit on <laughs> before you un unwind the hatch, you know, and then you, once you've unwound the hatch, then sort of the door opens and it's obviously all silent pretty much because you've you know you're in this suit so it's yeah all, all you can hear is yourself breathing much like a uh, sort of kubrick's you know interpretation of yeah it. and then he said you feel like you're sort of giving birth sort of squeezing out and they said and then the, the, and then you're struck with this this sight of the of the earth rotating actually quite fast because you're going about if you're going about 14 14 14 000 miles an hour or something yeah yeah it has to be that fast to sustain orbit. Yeah. And he and the uh, and he said that then you're sort of like you look behind you and the kind of you know this this infinity stretched out behind you and this is sort of you know he said it's hard you know it's hard. there's someone in your ear shouting can you get on with the job please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had this very same conversation who's with a friend of mine who's an astronaut called Mike Massimino, and about four weeks ago. And I, I've been friends with him for about eight years. And I, the first thing I did was I tapped him up about the, the overview effect because, because it's, he, you know, it's a spiritual connection, right? Yeah. You look, you're, and that I had this, it was funny. Um, so this was seven years ago, half term with the kids. I got the kids for the day. What am I going to do? I, I took them to the IMAX at Waterloo. There was something showing. And it was this NASA film. You've got to go and see it if you can, called oh, Hubble. Definitely. It's, and it's, it's when they recommissioned the space shuttle and they, they for this one trip to go and fix the Hubble telescope. Right, and wow. I met this guy, Mike Massimino, at a radio gig because he came backstage and he showed, showed us a photo of him holding a copy of In Rainbows in orbit in the space shuttle. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Amazing. And I'm, like, I'm right on. I'm like, Mike, I'm, I'm like, I've read all about the interview. Anyway, 
So I'm watching this film with the kids and it's fucking Mike. Mike's the guy who fixes the <laughs> Hubble. So I, I've been, I've, I wrote a song, there's a song on the record called Mass, which was, we went to see it. We went to see it in the morning and I wrote this, I didn't write it, it came out that afternoon. But what you got, even with, on IMAX, on, on the camera, on the film, so it was whatever, what is IMAX? Is it 70 millimeter or something? Yeah, I but think it's, so, yeah. Yeah, it's film you felt this incredible beauty and love for the planet below. Wow. And it's so interesting because a, a month later, I went to see that, see Gravity in the same cinema, kind of similar place and space with CGI. It didn't feel a thing. Really? And yeah, yeah. It was so interesting. It's a bit like music catching me, the magic yeah, of wow. music on tape. It's like the difference between CGI and the, re and the real thing was so moving. It was, it's such a powerful, it's like a 15 minute doc and they do it. And at the end, they, wow. they, they, they render a, 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 an image of a faraway galaxy that Hubble's taken, but they do the kind of, they do the journey there. And they, you're going wow. like this. And it's a bit like you, you want to hear can or something or, or yeah, your record yeah. along to it it's like it's like trance you want some kind of trance music to accompany wow. it um wow. but yeah it's, it's, it's like, the hubble zoom <laughs> yeah the hubble zoom but but the, i imagine it's like the millennium falcon gearing up for hyperspace you know? it's exactly like that, man. <laughs> it's in our dna isn't it it's so in there that when well, they go into hyperspace it is yeah, yeah. i mean um, yeah it's just like i don't know i mean i'm, si I'm sitting here under a, a huge telescope actually Oh wow! Yeah. Which oh my is, God! Which is, which, is, which is my dad's, and uh, and uh, and I, the first time I set it up in here, yeah. I, I, I found this little spot in the sky that's looking looking sort of south over over northwest London. Yeah. And I, was, yeah. I wonder what that is. <laughs> I focused the telescope in, and it was Saturn, and I could even see its rings. And I was, <laughs> no way! I was so blown away. I thought, and I've barely touched it since. <laughs> you know, you can see you can see Jupiter at the moment, apparently with the three moons. That's apparently on a, on I a bright seen moons, but I've I've seen like Jupiter and Saturn are in the same patch in the sky. Yeah. Wow. And um, and apparently at the end of this year, as the as the um as we move around the sun, the angle that the they, Jupiter and Saturn um coincide. And it's uh, and it's kind of and apparently it's known as the Great Conjunction, and it's a, oh a, yeah, of course, and that's yeah, it's Probably epic astrologically, great. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a very big. Uh, it's supposed to be a very symbolic. Uh, I mean, yeah, like astrology is one of those funny ones where it's like astronomers probably are like me. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when you meet people and you can see, you can and you sort of know and see like what star sign they are. Yeah, you shouldn't really be able to know. But it's quite weird. Well, we grew up as well, like astrology got a bad name. Where, I mean, I'm from Oxford, so Oxford is very cerebral, very sort of, you know. Um, and ast astrology was the kind of, it was the domain of Russell Grant. Now you're a Sagittarius. Yeah, yeah. And it was all like that. But it's so interesting as I got older, and I've said this on these, I've really been drawn to, because in Hinduism, astrology is a really big deal. Right. And, um, and I actually had my chart done about four years ago. I'm, I'm really kind of like, first 30 years of my life, I was kind of like, I'm shutting myself off to everything. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. No, it's all not. And the, the last 20 odd years, I've been like, I'm just, I want experience. And yeah. there's, it's bonkers. And the time of day that you're born yeah. and all of that, it's really, uh, well, of course, astrology used to be, along with mathematics and astronomy and what it was part of the, what did they call it the grammatica it was part of what you learnt in greece so knowledge yeah. of the stars and the and yeah. the and, and the, the the spheres what is it the the music of the, the spheres was 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 a real thing and is a real thing yeah i mean there's the uh there's the, you know like i've just been reading this book about how uh essentially all you know all you know all matter is conscious essentially yeah which uh <laughs> That's pretty. Uh, that's that's a pretty bizarre concept, but uh, I think that you know if if, if that is uh, you know if there, if there is truly this this sort of connection between you know this almost a, a conscious conversation between all matter in the universe, yeah. and it's cool, of course the position of the planets are going to affect that. You know they're pretty large objects. Yeah, of course they do. And I told you, didn't I, when we speak on the phone? Like I got this. Uh, NASA have done these recordings of of 
of the planets. And I don't, I mean, I think they're kind of, it's like, it's like data they picked up and they've kind of assigned notes to it. But they, they issued what? it, for, it was on iTunes and they issued it about 10 years ago. And they've got sort of Saturn for 58 minutes. And it's, you know, it's like a, it's it, like a, it's always, like. They're pretty strange, aren't they? I think yeah, it's like an EMS synthy or whatever, having yeah, a little yeah. synthy <laughs> They probably just had Eno, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's probably Eno in the background, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Like Windows startup, no one cut it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's um, yeah, it's funny. I like it's. I mean, we're so lucky as well. Being in, I mean, being in music, you know, as you get older, you're allowed to, you know, musicians and producers and. This is all part of the pre, you know, the conversations that we have in the studio, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they sort of, uh, they just, you know, they, when the, the drummer, the drummer's already bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, we, I mean, I'm, I just, I just always, I've always been one to go off on sort of con the conspiracy theory tangents and uh, yeah, just, usually just to provoke, to provoke conversation. Um, but, um, you know. Yeah, they're great. You should get Flood. Have you got Flood? Because Flood is great on all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, he's Flood, Flood is, uh, he's part of the, it's great. And I will never shout down people. He's like, he's going to the landing on the moon. We're, we're fake. He's one of that lot. Oh, no. he's, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. How do we know? I mean, I don't think, yeah. it, I mean, uh, you know, anyway. So, um, yeah, it's, okay. <laughs> it goes with the territory. It's all good fun. Yeah, um, I, we, I, I, wanna, I know what I want to talk to you about quite a bit about was meditation because we talked a little bit about that before because we discovered that we both meditate yeah so what was your what was what why did you get into it and what was your route into it well i so my, my my father was quite interested in all that all that stuff he was very you know very he he, he had a you know, he he was a meditator and you know very much into kind of the sort of uh sort of Hindu pursuits and later Kabbalah. Um, oh so wow! I, I was so I, was, I, know, I was just you know I was obviously rejected it as a kid, but um, then I you know, then as I got older I kind of I got to a point about you know kind of, you know ten years ago and I and and you know it's, it's you know sometimes you, it's a it's a stressful job and you and and, and sometimes you know any any job you do if you, there's pressures and um, you know regardless of what they are and I and I yeah. and I and I and, and, and in my past I dealt with them in ways that maybe weren't healthy for me. And um and so that I I I looked to I found someone who who you know I mean you're not you don't teach meditation you teach someone how to access use how to act, how to allow themselves to access it and and you get, and give support and I and I sort of found this guy and who sort of did, who, and he taught me the principles of mindfulness and and um and it some some you know things things changed in in how I related to people yeah in a very subtle way and I kind of and I've and it's you know and, I'm, and sometimes it's hard to hold the path and sometimes it isn't and and i've and i've sort of done it on and off since then as a as you know try to and i know when i'm i know when i'm in a phase where i'm looking after myself when i'm able to keep the practice going and i know i'm in a phase where i'm letting life get in the way when i when when the practice falls away so for me it's a very it's just a very good um a very good marker of where i where i am in my um in you know in my kind of psychological health yeah, because you've got, I mean, it's, it's funny because I was thinking about like, you know, what you've done and what you've, I mean, you know, for anybody watching, they'll probably be aware, but you, you, and it's funny because your email address, which I'm not going to say, but has pressure in it. And I thought, man, you've really, it's like, you've, you've done incredible work and you've had unbelievable success, right? But you haven't like, you've, you've, you've gone for it as well. You're like, I'm going to take on this, this studio which yeah. nobody has had probably managed to make that. And, and that's no discredit, this is the church to you, but David <laughs> probably didn't re make it run as a business, neither did Dave Stewart. And you've kind of, like, you've opened the space up. You're, you, I know from somebody I know who, who rents the room, you've got, you're renting out all these spaces to all these other musicians and stuff. You, it's, 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 there's a lot going on in your life, isn't there? Yeah, and, uh, but at the same time that... The, the, you know, I kind of, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a space where like, I feel like it's, it's, it, it's, it's mine. It, it's only mine to be able to present other people with access to it. Yeah. 
that's the and and like and I know that t sort of testament to the testament to the studio is how many good records are made there. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, out, you know, more more outside of outside of the stuff the stuff I do. You know, this but you know that we've. Had, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm told that he, so you said he spent a lot of time there making OK Computer. We spent, we spent, we only spent a month there. We, we were, it was the beginning of 1987. We started it, we'd done a mobile, we'd done a load of mo mobile recording down in um, St. Catherine's Court, which was the actress Jane Seymour's house outside Bath, which was amazing. And we, you know, we'd taken the 24-track tape machine. We had a we had a Malcolm Toft desk that we just bought that summer, and we then we, so we did a load of mobile recording. And then in January, we we're looking for somewhere to do. Essentially, it was mainly vocals. And I remember it was, you know, January's never nice, but January in the church at that time was. <laughs> I think we got very much. We was I. We didn't get a lot done, and I, I think it was it was just it's that last bit of the record when you have eighty percent of it done, and it's the last twenty percent that seems to take forever, and you're excited funny... because you've, you know, and but you just want to get it done. Come on! And then we went. Oh, I think then we because the I tell you the other place that had just opened then was um, Air Studios in Hampstead had just opened all. But that, so we fin we sort of did it that finished there and then. Nigel mixed it in um, uh, that place that used to be in Primrose Hill, that student Primrose Hill. Mayfair. Yeah, we, we Mayfair, so, exactly. So here's what I haven't told you is that I okay. made you tea at Air Studios on the No, OK yes. <laughs> what back back in back in '97? '97, yeah, I was the tea no boy. No way! Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> and I, I signed your tapes in and signed them out. Wow, and you didn't leak them either. Well, not that there was anything to leak. I tried. <laughs> wow. So how long were you at Air for? Was did you stay there um, for a while? I was there for I was there for about two years, and and I'd, I'd been engineering for a couple of years at a very, a very small studio before that, and yeah. then and then I sort of Air was a, such a specific place, and that you know at the time I was really and I wanted to get into sort of making dance records, um, electronic records, and and Air. I mean Air for all I learned from all watching the film scores being made and, 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 and being able to hover in the background, making tea for people while, but while bands were in studio one. Yeah. Um, and, and I assisted on the Mark Hollis record. Oh um, no way. Oh, you worked on that Mark Hollis yeah. record. Oh fuck. I love that record. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do anything apart from uh, to try and repair some tape, which had blown up on a tape machine. Um, but so, and I, and I went to strong room from there. So, um, wow. A, a little window but I, I, I you know i remember at the time feeling very very excited that that, that, that the possibility that radiohead were coming in i hope um, we well were we well behaved were you're we very, nice? yeah you're much better behaved than wet 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 <laughs> <laughs> well they were big co they were they were notorious cocaine heads weren't they, they oh were, i, I mean i think i think i think they was, were... any anything anything that went their direction was there uh, yeah uh, wow so you then went from the strong room and where did you go after that um, and then I did, uh, and then I, I found, and then I went to a little, uh, little. Do you remember Chiswick Reach, a little Valve Studio down in Chiswick? It was. No, uh, that... It had this old desk that was built by um, by Joe Meek's right hand man, a guy called Vic Carey. Wow. And it was an old old Valve desk that was just looked like it had been made. You know, it was like it looked like some kind of sort of mad scientist prototype with black panels and these old sort of, uh, you know, look what looked like the old. Um, the old rack api faders and yeah and it was you know, it was a pretty mad place but there's some you know again i and you know, i got to work with john lecky down there and i got i worked with uncle for the second time i've having worked wow with and you know and sort of um and then and then gradually the uh, the, sort of, the engineering work dried up which probably <laughs> says a lot about my engineering skills <laughs> so how did you what i mean so then what happened because you i thought because my i thought you were in a band and that's how you that's was the band pre the pre the pre the no, studio stuff? No, the, so the studio. I'd, I'd been in bands before the studio stuff, and then the studio yes. thing became a job because as soon as you start working in studios, you're under this illusion that I'll be able to make music on the side, and then you realise you're working two hundred hours a week. Yeah. Um. Um. For for you know for less than minimum wage a week, and um and um the and then I and then and then I so after I, after I sort of I start you know the studio stuff dried up because the studio closed. And I ended up 
going back to doing live stuff because I've done a bit of live sound over the years and and I um and part of that I sort of wound up getting uh, getting involved with uh, setting up 93 feet east oh really uh, yeah so we set, set, set I sort of helped I, I helped set that up and bring sort of promoters and agents in because I knew a few from being out you know doing gigs yeah and then, and then and then from there every time you know bands would come through occasionally and pick me up and I'd go out so you know one of the bands that came through was the rapture and another one was Royce up and then the rapture went the guy who was doing sound for the rapture was uh, a guy called James who um who said who, who called me up about six months later after I finished with the rapture and went I've started my own band and I'm what's that it's LCD sound system <laughs> so what so, so I went off I did LCD sound system's first ever show James the, Murphy he, I, he did the sound for the rapture no well. it's because yeah because James had done the record first record oh my god and then and then he then he was <laughs> going to go off and do the LCD sound system instead of being a sound guy yeah and, and um and but when when LCD sound system got started up, he and he said, "Oh, we've got a gig. Do you want to come and do the sound?" I was wow! Like, so I, I toured with LCD sound system for a couple of years. No way! Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then, and then ended up, and then, and all on the side of this, I had a band as well, which were called Lomax, who were, who were a kind of um, gang of four, killing joke, sort of sort of post-punk thing, you know, yeah. it's all, all, the, all, you know, it's all connected. Yeah. It? That was yeah. all the time, wasn't it? They're kind of, yeah. and then, and, then um, at our, and that's our, um, sort of, we did a maiden album that we did on 93 Feet East Records. And then the, the, the night we launched the record, our press guy showed up with this, uh, with this, this, this young, these young kids who just started a band. And I said, oh, what's the band called? They're like, Block Party. <laughs> and uh, so there's all these weird, these weird little connections that, uh, and then I kind of went off about six, two months later, I was doing sound for the kills somewhere and the support band showed up and it was the future heads. No and way. Three months like later, was, so it's because I had, the, I sort of, you know, I basically blagged it because I was a decent life sound engineer because I'd had loads of experience in studios. Oh my um, God. But, um, you know, then obviously the, the future heads called and then, and then block party called. And that was it. And I was, I suddenly, I, I could suddenly pay the rent. You're often, I'm, is your middle name Zelig by any chance? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> wow but i'd know i mean i you know i listen yeah. i knew i i i my my concept was i thought it was just, i knew you'd start a block party i thought my i had no idea you did the live sound so you've got like this complete kind of 360 view and actually you know what it's probably i would imagine that's really you know especially when you're recording a band because you understand the live thing i think one of the frustrations that one of the things I found with Flood that was really interesting, which I'd never had before, Flood does this thing, when he records you, he sits in the live room with the band. <clears throat> wow. So when you're doing a live take, he's in there with you. And I'm like, like, which was actually, you know, for me it was brilliant at first because, you know, I'm in the studio and I've got Omar Hakim and Nathan and yeah. Dave, David Akumu, and I'm like, yeah. I'm, le you know, so... Flood was really, you know, really helpful. But, um, and he's, again, it's about the overall life sound, being in the room and understanding. But you have an yeah. understanding of that, that, that what music, from the life thing, what musicians need. And it's a different, it's a yeah. totally different thing. And especially with, I guess, with live bands, like, I think one of the things that we were always trying to do in the early days, like the first two records is, we were trying to capture the, the energy of live yeah. onto record, which is actually not, an easy thing to do right yeah. you know yeah i mean it's, it's definitely like uh, i mean i you know i think that you know it's it's it's, it's funny now that you know especially be, i've been working in an open plan studio yeah that you kind of you that are you know that's one of the reasons i like doing that is because it's very easy to go and run over and wave at the drummer without you suddenly having to appear in the room and like or you go over and you start playing with pedals without having you know there's none of it doesn't feel like there's any separation. And I think yeah. I, I totally understand why Flood does that. And the other thing is, I think what he's put, I imagine he's probably, li he's probably listening to what the, to what the sounds are and, and the chemistry and the balance and the conversation there, because so that he doesn't have a false impression of it. Yeah. And he, he said, he said, I mean, he's got that other thing. He, I thought what was brilliant, his bedside manner is unbelievable. He's like, he drums it into his engineers. And I'm sure as you do, like, you yeah. know, when that red light goes on and those musicians start playing, unless you create the right environment, that can be a tough gig. Yeah. You know? and, and also, especially with overdubs, when that person has to come up with something like, yeah. you know, I've had it in times of my time. 
No, we've all been there when it feels yeah. like you've got a gun to your head. Right, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, Whoa, yeah. Tell a joke. Yeah, well, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but it's that thing of like, it, it was partly to put the musicians at ease, but also he said it was to do with, because um, he'd had it on so many occasions, like the band would be saying, it would be sounding amazing in the live room. And they come into the, come into the control room and, you know, and it wasn't, they'd be really disappointed hearing what yeah. was coming off tape or whatever. So that's a kind of way to mitigate that. And it, you know, anyway, it was, a, it's a, That's really it's, interesting. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's a really, I'd never come, I'd never come across that before. And I'm sure like you, his whole thing is like, well, where do you, where do you most feel comfortable? Because I know that you can sometimes go in a studio and it's like, right, the drummer has to go over there. You have yeah. to go there, 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 there. He's very much of like, okay, well, you know, rather than setting up the gear, he's like, okay, get the musicians in the room. Um, okay, where does everybody feel like gravitating? And it's like, uh, I really like it here. You know, you, often you have a, the worst place I always used to remember, like, you know, in Radiohead, we, had, we, had, we, we sold this studio. We had this studio out in Oxfordshire. And it, the live room wasn't great. We never kind of, we never really went for it in terms of, we, we, ha we bought this, barn and we can this these three barns and we converted it but we kept one eye on it being a house whereas yeah. we should have probably gone for it so the live room was always a bit compromised and there was one really bad place and it was the <laughs> place where everyone used to walk through to the door <laughs> <laughs> and i, I might have got, got it wrong there. but i remember fucking getting that and it was because you know my pedals and people having to stand over my pedals and they might hit one or something like that and i'm like so when he used to come out to carving out the territory at the start of a project, get in the far corner. You know? Yeah. But yeah, it, <laughs> you'd, always, you'd have to arrive early. <laughs> I, well, I always used to do that anyway. My whole thing was like, I, I, I always liked that thing, getting into the studio early and having an hour or an hour and a half trying to create sounds. That was, you know, because if, if you're a guitarist, when, what, if you're up and running with a studio, you know, the way it was quite... I couldn't get into the live room to make sounds because there might be another overdub being going on. Yeah. So you want, you want a bit of time to do a bit of R and D on your sounds yeah. and you know, yeah. all of that and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely the, 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 the pre, the pre-production bit with, uh, it's kind of, you know, unless you take your pedal boards home, you have to, you have to do it in the, yeah. you know, doing it in the space, don't you? Yeah. Um, and I, I always like, I like preparation. I always like, I don't know, like with you, like, I don't know if it still happens, but like to have a new piece of gear or something that you arrive um, with a new, a new project that you've got and you've done a bit of homework, you've got a few sounds or you've got a couple of new pedals so that you've got something immediately to kind of go, okay, I've got this or do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of neat. You, 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 I mean, it's funny, like you, you, you add one pedal to the mix. Yeah. And it can and it can suddenly like it, I mean I, I've got this whole philosophy about instruments and the instruments having a song in them. Yeah, they're, they're always you know like they're always you know you buy a new piece of gear or like you know like a, like particularly guitars I think and yeah. and, you, and you're like you sort of you look at them and you just sort of you know there's a you know there's a tune yeah you know there's a tune in them. Do you know what is this that, is? Is that a Yamaha or yeah. a Guild? It's a Yamaha. It, that, you're a John McLaughlin fan. Total John McGeough fan. <laughs> yeah. And this, this guitar, I ju I've just literally got this, the um, lovely Mark at Yamaha located one. And honestly, like you, when you said, when you said there's a song in the gu this <laughs> yeah. guitar, I fucking love it. Have you, tr have you played one of these? No, no, I'd love to. I love it. John McLaughlin's one of my guitar heroes. Have you tracked with one? Have you ever no, tracked one? No. All right, I'll bring it to the studio. Yeah, man, look, that'd be amazing. It's guess, so great. I know, I better brush up on devotion. <laughs> <laughs> I was a massive <laughs> McGeoch, like all the stuff that he did, like for, okay, for people listening, just to give them rather, John McGeoch was a, an amazing guitarist who started in magazine, uh, went into Susie and the Banshees, then went into, he was in a band with Jobson called The Armory Show, then went into Pill with Leiden. And I really liked the records he did with Pill, actually. I thought they were, they were pretty different from the early stuff, but they were, um, they were kind of late, good late 80s stuff. And he was, like, his stuff with Susie and the Banshees, man, yeah. like Christine, Happy House, Israel, Cities of cities and dust. Is City, it? 
Spellbound. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the kind of... I was thinking of John, Mc, John McLaughlin from Mahavishnu Oh, the, did he play one of those as well? He played the Yamaha, yeah, he plays the Yamaha, um, the, like the sort of double cutaway at um, ah. SG Les Paul, um, which is, uh, I think that was, that, was his, that was his one as well. So, I mean, uh, Sorry, I, I kept on correcting you because I, I thought you got it wrong. You no, 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 it's, it's the... Uh, <laughs> this, no, it's the, uh, the uh, I think I think just the, 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 those those yeah. those here with Yamahas with a special well, they, they were clearly a special guitar if you know if you know you know and I, they're right. one of the ones that I've always quite fancied having and never had a go. They're really great because they've got like um they've got because they're the, the, the hum, they're humbuckers but the humbuckers become genuine single coils they've got coil taps and wow. that's how they get that's that classic like McGeoch from Banshees it was real kind of ch that chimey sound. Wow. So, you know, the, oh, the, I've, I've got to try and get my hands on one. They're really, I'll tell you, the, the, Johnny Mars, he's a great, he's like my older brother. And he's, yeah. and he's, he's, he's been banging on about SGs. He's, he's been using them in the studio for a long time. Yeah. He, he loves them. He's, you know, and uh, so, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to, I, like when you said that, it's like, I'm, I'm basically at that stage where I'm just getting together um gear for the my next project for for the room <laughs> and i'm you know and, but the other thing is that you the other thing is you've got which you've got to be careful of is if you get too much gear then you don't really get under the hood you don't really no, get to know, know that gear no, do you <laughs> no i think that's the <laughs> i might i might be guilty of being a collector yeah. and a hoarder <laughs> well it's so but it's so easily done it's like yeah. you know when you've when you've made when you've made some money and you're just a fan of music and and you see a TR909 that's on sale for, you know, Roland TR909 drum machine. I machines definitely need that right now. I need that. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, the funny thing is, that it's just like, it's, it's, I'm the, part, the, part, the part of my, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, if I have any excuses for my, for my, my guilty, my, my, my museum-like connect, collection of nonsense at the church, yeah. it's, um, part of it's just because you, you know, people come into the studio and they go, Wow, what's that? And they go and they do the most. That, and that, and like everything's like beginner's luck. Yeah. So, so you've just got you just basically you've just got this inc this huge kind of like vortex of beginner's luck that floats around. And beginner's luck is a very valuable thing, I feel. Yeah. Studio. It's like it, because what it does is it's, it's it, it sets people up for first takes. And first takes before the brains had a chance to analyze it or question the performance. Before yeah. the before the ego's telling them it's terrible or it's amazing, there's yeah. a, there's that there's that sort of very in, in, innocent like oh what happens if I do this yeah and then sparks fly and yeah. uh, and so like and and I guess it's in some ways maybe that maybe that having you know lots of things to fiddle around on sometimes you just go well like, that's what I'm going to use for this and you fiddle around a bit and suddenly that that little thing happens and but conversely like it, it's it's really it's really great if you get under the hood and yeah and, and you know and, and you know oh some, you, someone who knows who really knows the so how how to get the best out of the, yeah. that particular piece of kit and uh you know i had this conversation with someone earlier today about the the kind of uh you know trying to stay on you know yeah, you know, I was talking about what, wanting to make an Ableton record. You know, initially I wanted my record to be just a really super electronic, very modern, um, and and it was, and I think there's that thing of just like sometimes you just got to know what your tool is, what yeah. Your, what your specialist, what your that special, totally. What your that specialist thing that is your, you know, that you know inside out. And totally. I heard the story about Jai Paul using Logic Logic Eight or something. On a you know on a on a, on a on a PC version, I think it was the first version that came out for the PC, yeah. And he never moved on from it because he was like, "That's my sound." Yeah. And then you know that it was like it's like a fifteen-year-old version of Logic. I totally agree with you. I like I kind of I think it's so interesting what you said. Is you have it's funny this thing with with equipment and gears that you have the initial stage, which is like like that playful thing that you're talking about. Stuff happens. Yeah. Then there's there's the middling grey area, and then if you put enough time in, you become you know you you know that's your thing. You you get under the hood. You know how it works. But I agree with you totally. I'm, it's funny you should say that. I'm I'm having to put together because I I think that you know realistically, I've never kind of got a home studio si situation together because I, I I think I told you I 
don't like engineering myself and playing at the same I can't do it. It's like... Two different parts of the brain. It's weird. It's like I can't even press the start and record button and do it. It's like I need... And so I learned, okay, just go and demo with somebody. Spend some time with a good engineer and just demo stuff. And that's the way it works. Yeah. But I realized I've got to get a little... I'm getting a little studio set up together. And, and one of the things I've been going through is like, well, what shall I use? What shall I record? And because... Yeah. I start, you know, Ableton is great. You know, it's so brilliant to work with. But I had a real problem with Ableton. I started using it about eight years ago. And I think it's so brilliant for making stuff. But I found to me there was something sonically that was not ha happening for me. Yeah. And, and it, it was like everything that I was doing was just on a certain level. It was kind of just like, it, it sounded nice. Yeah. But none of it sounded great. It was all like, yeah, this is, you know what I mean? So I was kind of, so my thing has been like, I'm trying to go like, okay, am I really going to learn and do Pro Tools or am I going to go Logic? So I'm yeah. obviously going to go Pro Tools, but, you know, and, and go, okay, that's what I got to do. And, you know, I've just got to yeah. get my head around it and do it, all of that stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's funny. I mean, like, cause I've been, Ableton is, you know, going from being a Pro Tools and Logic, you know, I've started on Logic and then, and then you know, Pro Tools, we, you know, everybody uses studios. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that Ableton definitely has, sort of has a bit of a sound. But once, once I got into the idea of actually just doing stuff in it and sort of accepting that, there's so many, like the, the main thing that I found absolutely amazing about it is that you can just keep doing stuff and the music never stops. Wow. That the fact that you just keep doing and you're bringing sounds in and, and, and because it never yeah. stops, it's like you're jamming with yourself. Yeah. And, then, and these ideas, and before, I mean, like before you know it, you've kind of come up with something that that you like. You sit, you stop it, and you realise, or you you think you've been there five minutes and you've been there an hour, or you think you've been there an hour and you've been there five minutes, and the track's done. You know, wow. and you you're sort of, and then you, and then while it's playing, and then you sort of stick it in record, and suddenly it starts recording it into the into the into the arrange window. I mean, Logic's now got sort of they've sort of copied this function a bit, yeah. And that for being able to kind of go, this little strip's an idea, this strip's an idea, and then you go record, and then you just kind of start switching things on and off, and then before you know it, you've got an arrangement. Did you so? Did you do Voyager? Was Voyager done on Ableton? No, it wasn't. I mean, that was that. That was the the the, the funny thing was I'd, I'd find myself getting to a point where I'd get frustrated about not being able to because my my skills on Ableton weren't solid enough that, and fast enough. I'd, I'd get I'd get to a point where I was frustrated by it. Yeah, um, and that's purely because I, I don't use it all the time. Um, I don't use any one thing as enough to to be to be a super sharp shooter and and. Uh, and and you know I'm sort of jack, I'm sort of jack of all, um, but there was a, a young guy who who um, an artist called Harry Edwards who we uh, we we um, we worked we worked with at Wolf Tone, and um, he's a he's a real um, sort of headphones and Ableton auteur, who who makes some incredible soundscapes and he's got you know he's a he's a multi instrumentalist, um, and so he came and hung with us and and so you know I'd, I'd sort of knock up ideas and then fire them over to him or we'd go and have a jam and then chuck chuck them over to him and he'd sort of manipulate them and you know and i still to this day don't understand how he how he got from the ideas that you know he, he's a, you know he's a real you know he, he thinks in a very avant-garde way and um and so it was really useful for me to it, it, it meant it was that he always had him to bounce off to pull me out of pop world yeah um and um and it sort of and it and it's you know and it's and, he, and obviously, because he was on Ableton, he's only ever worked on Ableton. Despite spending five years in my studio with me, he know, he still resolutely won't he won't do anything outside of Ableton, pretty much. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to force him to mix his record and get someone else to mix it and spit it out into Pro Tools. And I think he found yeah. the experience very stressful. Yeah, just because you know when you put something in Pro Tools, it's going to stay where it is unless you accidentally hit shuffle mode <laughs> yeah we had it's funny we had a lot i mean i don't want to get too techy because i have but it's interesting for um for me we I, I it was so interesting the whole pro tools thing because flood is like um i don't know if i told you this but like a, flood is flood has a sort of a love-hate relationship more veering on hate with pro tools and we 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 had to we initially we were going to do it all on 16 track tape um, and we started off doing it like that, which was great, obviously, for bass and drums. 
but um, he would do that. He opened up to this fact and, and he was, he was sort of arguing with Catherine, Catherine Marks a bit and Alan Mulder as well. Cause he flood is convinced that pro tools moves that, that he says he can, and he, he would do it like, and invariably it was about four o'clock. So there's more, more and more stuff have been recorded. We didn't use a load of plugins, so there's not a load of processing power, yeah. but there's more and more information. And he'd go, stop it right there, turn it off, go back to the last save. And it, he opened my ears to the fact that, I, and, and that sometimes the, the, the groove, that the, there's something that happens in Pro Tools, because, you know, as he says, a lot of the time that, that computer, that hard, hard drive wasn't made for the software anyway. So it was a real lesson in like, Ah, like, so the computer I, I think, isn't... I think he's right. Yeah, the computer isn't 100% right no, all the time. I you have to... I think he's right, and, you know, definitely. And I think he's... Uh, and I think, and I, he definitely, like, uh, you know, there's those moments when if, 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 any, if anything doesn't... If, anything, if, I've, if, if you get that sort of sixth sense, anything changes. Yeah. Just, and it might have been because he, he, he said the same thing. He might have said the same thing at some point. Yeah. Um, and I, but he, I think he's right, you know. And I think I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily Pro Tools. I think you know sometimes it's just that, you know, one, you know, one co you know, a couple of, a couple of things get stuck in a buffer somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, especially or or like or or, or delay. You know, we get, we get I'll get I'll get really techy given half a chance. And um, yeah. it, um, but I think you know, the beauty that's the, the beauty of recording to tape really is the fact that you know that it's it's. You know, it's not the tape, the, tape, the tape machine isn't calculating where stuff is. Yeah. It's, it's it really is there. It's just, do you still do you do a lot? Do you still record to tape quite a bit? We, have, do you... we have we have some great tape machines at the studio, and I, yeah. I, you know, you, you know, I, I think if I if I if I was to if I was to get a live band in, and I know, and I was they were going to cut stuff, and that it and and to cut it, and just we were going to try and preserve the integrity of those recordings or at least get you go get those sound and it you know um it's i don't think i don't think anything sounds anywhere near as good yeah it's just you know it really is has got you know it's got the, the, you know it's just got this character to it and and uh and and a, and a vibe and it's you know but i guess that sometimes that for me that the, the there's a there is a, a there, if you're so used to working in a digital world yeah you, if you're used to, if you're used to fast food when you're you know <laughs> i know do you know what it was funny because like, i'd never we'd never i'd never done stuff on 16 track tape and we had a we the gear that we rented in at the beginning so we set up we did a mobile recording setup and we had it went through pro tools it went through the tape machine and then into pro tools to, as a kind of backup but it was on 16 track and the bass and the drums nathan east but yeah. bass player to everybody he was he was this he was like how did you get that bass sound and flood was like well that's part of what i do but also there was an there was a discernible difference with, i'm sure you've known this but 16 track and 24 track it was yes. just like oh my god it's almost like i mean i know that jack white is eight track he's eight track is his thing yeah, yeah. Um, but it is the the sound quality even from 24 to 16 you could notice it was, yeah, it was yeah. discernible well, it was well, amazing I, I, we're, 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 we're going we're going to the, uh, the bob dylan machine room when we when you when you when you, when you, if you come up to the church great a, the um the, the room that dave, dave stewart made converted to make it look like bob dylan's bedroom in the 60s um <laughs> it's now it's now we, we we have our tape machines um wow but um, but I, I, we could, we've got a couple. We've got a couple. Of, we've got we've got a very special tape machine. Or a couple of very special tape machines up there that don't get as much use as they should. But now we've had this conversation that oh man, <laughs> <laughs> ones ones with valves in them. Yeah, um, and you know what? I'm not going to ask you about it. But I was so I'm because it's it's not fair to us. But I was so wanted. Someday I'm going to ask you about the Stone Roses. Oh, that was that was crazy <laughs> yeah man because you know i so i'm like i was at manchester i was at manchester university when the roses really? yeah I, I was at manchester university from 87 to 90 and talk about being i mean the only reason i went wow. to manchester university because coming from oxford i had to go to i was in this little band this band from school which was the band <laughs> and I, I was just like, I need to go to Music City because I need to know. Like Oxford, there was, at that stage, there was no infrastructure. I yep. need to understand and, get, you know, and I got involved with socials and book stuff. And 
did a little club in town and got involved and roadied and got, you know, got, you know, the, 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 the university and the town scene, the people who did the PA and lights who you'd book would also do them for the roses and the Mondays. Yeah. So for me, like, you know, that for that, the stone roses and the Mondays are like, I mean, you know, they going down the Hacienda, they were the ones that kind of, you know, I was classic yeah. indie kids. They made me want to dance and, 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 you know, Rennie as a drummer, was like, I mean, you work with fucking Rennie. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have breaks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, what what that? I, I mean, talk about pressure. I mean, I know, but I think that's so fucking ballsy. Like, you know, that's a tough gig, right? Their no, comeback it, record and all of that stuff. And but you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, right? I didn't even I didn't even question it. I mean, I sort of I put I put my hand I put my hand up, and it, I think yeah. I think round, but. I mean, I'd, I'd worked with, I did, a, I did a couple of tracks of Primal Scream, um, yeah, maybe going back 13 years, 13 years ago. And, and Manny, Manny was playing with them then. And, and, like, and uh, I, yeah. so we, we, we got, we, we, you know, we really got on. And, and then when, so when, when, when sort of word got round that there was the, the day, well, when they were thinking about doing this stuff and I think they'd heard that I said, I'll do it. Yeah. And then, like, I've worked with Paul, and he's, you know, he's, 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 he's fun to work with. And uh, and but it was, I mean, it, you know, as a band, they're all so they're all so nice and and so kind of you know, I think if you've had a break like if you've made so many those those successful records and had that long break and you're excited to be back back together again, it's you know, they I think they were just they were just you know they were like a bunch they were like, they were like a bunch of kids who had just, yeah, you know like. Uh, they probably they they probably were, were were conveniently regressing to how they were when they were sixteen when they started the band, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was yeah it was a real experience, man. Like um, we we had a lot of fun doing that, and uh, and I think the uh, I think the only thing that uh, the, the only thing they they may regret was <laughs> was, was letting me mi mix the single. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think they used the desk mix, and uh, it was like it was just a monitor mix, and I think. Um, you know, but again, analog. I, you yeah. know, just the faders up on the neve, and, uh, right. and it's you know, it's something sound, it's something sounded good that, where you know that you couldn't. It was difficult to recreate when we when when everyone tried to do it. And but yeah, I think they're like um yeah, they're, they're, they're a special band. Yeah, they were a special band. They were like I, it's like they were they were really so, yeah, really really important in. It's a funny thing, isn't it, when a band gets back together again? Because again, it's a, you know, they must have loved it. But especially a band like that, you must really, at times, I don't know, maybe they didn't feel the weight on their shoulders. Maybe they just kind of went out and like, you know, I think I've always said it. I've always said this. It's like a band that comes out of the blocks, their first album. If you've got such an amazing first album, it's yeah. really hard, isn't it? I've always, I, I like, you know, I thank God. I always say, like Pablo, honey, our first album was a shit album, apart from one song, <laughs> and that's not that's not to the detriment of Paul and Sean, who were the producers on it. That was because yeah. we hadn't we hadn't got our shit together. But you 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 only make your first album once, exactly. And I think it takes often it takes um, you know it takes the first album, and I've certainly seen felt this like myself on my own stuff. It takes you one album to get your head round it to really you know, okay, this is, okay, I don't like that. This is how I should be doing it. But, you know, you think of all the, all, so many artists who come out, Finley Quay, Stone Roses, The Lars, the first album is so extraordinary. And yeah. it's very hard, it's really hard to follow it up. Really hard. Although I think the Stone Roses did, did I thought they did really well because I actually really like the second record. Yeah, I um, mean, this, this, this is coming from the man who, who, who did the bend. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, like, like I mean that, that that record sounded so effortlessly genius. Well, that was yeah. Well, that was but that's a reaction because that was a total yeah. reaction to Pablo Honey, which was like we were we Pablo Honey. We were like it kind of forced us to wake up. We didn't really know what we we're doing. So by the time of the bends, it's like you have to have twelve songs that are all really strong, and yeah. you know, and then you get to work with John Lecky. And, yeah. you know, Sean Slade, Paul Calderi, who mixed it, it, that, that record's interesting because John would have done a very different mix on that record. He started to mix the bends 
And I hope he's still not, he was a bit upset because, but the mixes weren't happening to us because they didn't have an excitement to it. It was, it was more kind of psychedelic, which is more John, right? Because you've worked with him. Yeah. There was, yeah. It, was a, it was a lot more kind of, and we, we sent it over to Sean Slade and Paul Calderi, who did the first record. And they had a, I think they had the, a, an old Neve desk in Fort Apache where they did a lot of the, you know, the Pixies and stuff was recorded. And they, they, they took, they took, we sent the tapes over and they sent back about, I think they sent Fake Plastic Trees, which is the first track that they mixed. They sent it back and it sounded fucking great. And they just basically turned the guitars up. And I remember seeing them. I, 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 was, I did a little road trip that summer whilst they were mixing and I went out to see them in Boston whilst they were mixing it. And I go in there and it's, it was that great thing. No, no automatic faders. And they were just, they were, I think they were pretty high. They were smoking a lot, but they were, they were <laughs> laughing. They were giggling because they were just, they were on the board. So for people listening, like they were, so they, you know, so they'd have the levels and then they would just push the guitars. So Paul would probably have Johnny's guitar and guitars. And then uh, uh, Sean would have Tom and my guitars. And then the choruses, they just like try and see how high they would go. And I, I think, you know, <laughs> And it was like, it's, it was playful. It was, it was like, of course, and they said, they acknowledged, they said they were beautifully, he said the engineering on it was extraordinary, you know. But, um, yeah, wow. you know, so, uh, it yeah. It goes to show when you, when, you, when you mix something like a musician play, if you play a mixing desk like a musician playing an yeah. instrument, you know, it, it, it does add life to things. And like, you know, that's one of the things I miss of actually the, 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 the process of, 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 of of doing stuff on a desk because I, you know, now the, the 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 way I, the way I tend to, I mean, I've tr I've tried, I'm trying to bring some more of that kind of life into performance, into, 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 into perform, and but into 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 how I work with Pro Tools by sticking things in record and just pushing faders up and down and just, you know, giving things a little bit of life. But obviously, I mean, I, like I've never been a um, a, a great mixer. And 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 always been quite happy to at the end of a record when you've obsessed over it and you're like this close to it, to uh, <laughs> be able to, to be able to actually give give it to someone else who's got fresh ears and 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 who's able to kind of bring it to to to, to really bring it to life. Yeah. Um, so, so and sort of go <laughs> see ya. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think I think that's right, and I think it's like you either got the monitor mixes you know, which you do at the moment, at the time, which are often so good, or, yeah. you know, hand it over to someone else. Cause I just don't, I don't understand how you can get, you know, objectivity on it. I, I totally agree with you. And also to your credit, people who realize that, um, you know, the worst thing is if you've got a producer who probably who thinks they can mix and they're doing bad mixes, they're knocking out bad mixes. <laughs> that... <laughs> they get two practice over it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you when you when 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 you guys have uh, you know had to, had the privilege to work with the, the, the Nigel and the Nigels had the privilege to work with you guys, it's you know that the, you know, that, and, the, and, the, and those relationships, the producer artist relationship, yeah, can grow over a period of time. It's it, you know if you can end up with this immense sense of deep trust and and sort of intuition and and all those things which I think the modern music industry doesn't doesn't do anything to foster. Yeah, and um, and I think that's a, those the, those things are kind of, you know, the, those things can't you can't undervalue those, you know, and it's you know the think it's it's you know it's these days records are quite often made by you know sort of throwing you know throwing as many different situations together as you can, and seeing what comes out of it, and then feeding a little bit of the best one, but then it's, you know you still end up with as you know you still end up as one of ten producers on a record. Yeah, and sometimes you, eight writers on a song. Have you? Because you, have you found that? Because you've been. I mean, you've been involved with some big records. Has that been? Is that what happens? Do you? you would you kind of like sometimes? What happens? Say, so what happens on an Adele record? Do you get? Because I see Rick Rubin's kind of credited producing one, and you. What happens in those scenarios? Well, I mean, I guess with. Um, I mean, I think the, the specifically, I think. 21 was was an interesting one because you know i think adele knew she wanted rick to produce the record and and they and so the plan was to go and do loads of writing and then have and then make this really cohesive you know really cohesive 
and and high fi and high fi and classic timeless record with Rick, and cut the whole thing live and then cut orchestra afterwards, um, and so, and 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 um, but and so, you know, I sort of I I just made a record with Jack Pinata and, and met Adele when we were making that because she did backing vocals on it, and um and um. So and we ended up, did we end up sort of we got together to do some writing and it was the first time I first one and only time in my life I've 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 actually sat and written a song knowing I wasn't going to produce it <laughs> and um and uh, and so and and that was and that, so the, all those, the songs the three songs we did on twenty one were were we just we wrote them and they went off to Rick and then she cut the tracks with Rick and the, but the, and the tracks sounded great yeah but the one the one thing that the one problem I think she found was that. The vocals she'd done on 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 a particular the, the rolling the deep and and the, and, the, and a couple of the other tracks with me had been done and they were and they were you know they were the first they were sort of first takes and they were really raw yeah. and they were also like she was she was in the feeling that she was writing about when she was writing the song yeah and 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 then of course when, and when she'd done thirty takes of these songs to you know to try and get the performances right and she was singing live with the musicians I don't think, I think it's hard to recreate. Totally. I, it's um, so interesting and... you say that. It's that thing, isn't it? It's like when you, it's like, it's when you're in the demo stage, that first stage with a vocal or a thing, you're in the white heat of creativity. You're feeling yeah. it. Two months later, say, the yeah, hardest right part is getting back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, and, the other thing, and the other thing is that, you know, it's not like in the old days where you had a sort of uh, a shitty cassette demo that was done at the uh, basement studio Around, you know, where you just, you know, and it was done in, it was done in one evening. You know, these days you've got like a decent, you know, it's decently recorded. You know, you've been, you've been able to refine it in a computer and do some editing. And people get attached to the nuances in a, in a recording. Yeah. So even if it wasn't about the feeling, there were certain nuances that, uh, that, and I think, and this is the case in, you know, I suffer this every time, I suffer, you know, that, that, you know, if somebody says, can you produce this track? I know it's going to be impossible to beat beat the demo, and you just got to yeah. try and do do your best to do it, um, because the demo the demo sounds like a finished record to my ears, um, and then and then it's only and then you know you've got to you've got to do something that's sort of above and beyond to try and get the to try and do something that's that's going to make it any better, yeah, you know without without just kitchen, throwing the kitchen sink at it. And that and that's and that can that can that can be that can be quite difficult. That's really I totally. Because so you end I up know, overthinking I, it. Yeah, totally. And it's it's it, you feel a lot of. I mean, again, it's talk about pressure. It's the pressure of, you know, <laughs> you hear a demo and you think, well, how can, what am I going to do here? Yeah. I I totally now, know that. I mean, I, mean, I, I know that. Yeah. I I know that from my record is that like because I demoed like a lot and 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 one of the things I kept on coming back to when, when halfway through the records, I went back to the demos because it wasn't, the record wasn't sounding good. We'd thrown everything at it and it was stripping it. In fact, right. it was an, it was an interview I read with Spike Stent and I love Spike. And one of the things that he yeah, says Spike's when he mixes an that. album, he says he always gets the artist to play him the demos as well. So he hears it. And I, I was like, Oh, I should do that. And I went back to the demos uh -huh. and, and and thank God for, like you said, like, because the early demos were also recorded on Pro Tools. So we can bring that vocal in. Oh, and, and, and I think yeah. that's, that's the journey when it gets really interesting when it's, and it's happened with every Radiohead record that we made and it happened with my record. It's that thing where you're, you kind of can get lost a bit, but what happens at the end is suddenly by this, this kind of magical chemistry, isn't it, that happens and you pull things in together and, things that may have been recorded six months apart suddenly make sense. And, they, or, and it's like it's meant to yeah. always be. And that's kind of, but it, is, it must be very daunting as a producer when you're presented with something and the demo's so good, and you're like, well, well, well okay, what are we going to do here? It's, it's, it's a tough gig, man. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no, it is. It's, you know, it's, and it's, you know, and I think there's, there's, you know, so uh, you know, this it's, this it's definitely like the, what the, that's why I like. I, I, look, the thing I enjoy most is actually just going into a room with somebody, and sitting down and, and sort of and listening to a bunch of music that we both like, and finding yeah. the things that you know, and then and then having a little jam, and then somehow the things that you both like it feeds back into the ideas that you're playing around with, and then 
and then you know as soon as you find those those little nuggets of something you know then you're off and you're off on this on this path of discovery that you know yeah. you don't know you don't you know you, you don't know what you're going to draw out of the out of the ether you know from one moment to the next and sometimes it just i mean it's, as soon as i you know as soon as i get i mean as soon as i sort of get sight of a of a, of a, of a like I, it's almost like i I, can, I get sight of something i can hear it in my head and then i'm like a steam train i'm like no got to get it down before the idea yeah. is gone yeah yeah <laughs> and that's totally you just have to just have to just run it's like yeah, it's a race to the finish to try and cut at least even if it's the scrappiest messiest thing with like you know my my dreadful piano playing and out of time drumming and like the, you know the, and a basic bass line or you know or, or you know just it's just it's, it seems it's something it's like just to try and paint a picture that someone goes ah oh, i see what you're thinking there and then suddenly you're off yeah and then it, and then you're back to the trust thing where you yeah. where you did the fact that you know that up until that point so someone's going mm, is this guy insane <laughs> yeah totally you know have you're you, just have trying you... to catch that moment aren't you have you ever, have you ever, because I think this happens, have you ever found yourself in a situation whereby, like, you've been burnt out or you felt like I'm not feeling music anymore? Have you gone through a thing like where you're so overloaded with, have you had to take time out or have you always kind of been, has that never been a problem? Oh, man, yeah, no, I, you know what, I, um, I, 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 I sort of, sometimes I, sometimes I feel like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, 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 which, which it sounds like it sounds like a, like a moronic dichotomy, but the, it's just I, I guess I mean the one the one thing I do I do do which I think I, I found work what kind of works for me is have have periods of periods of stillness and periods of chaos, and yeah. and I kind of and I you know and I and I I um. And I find that like take if I take um, if I always try and take school holidays off so I can spend time with the family because they Brilliant. they you know they usually bring they bring me back down to earth and uh, and then I and then I go off and go have a you know a, a crazy creative splurge because I've got I've got fuel in the tank um, and and uh, um, you know and I think that for me that that balance seems to work really well. Um, but like you know, the one thing that this hard, this hard about that is sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea, and I wish I had a studio at home. But yeah. it's also quite good not having a studio at home because otherwise the kids would never never ever see me, <laughs> you know? or the wife would never ever see me. I uh, think that's really important. My um, experience of like, how old are your kids? They are, they're six and nine. Okay, so and I know because our kids are all at the same school. My kids are a little bit older. They're 16 and 14. Yeah. Sal's, Sal's now going into the sixth form. Right. But I, I like, I, oh, think wow. that, I think that thing of like, because when you have kids, when you've been in music, and I guess it's like in any form, like, but because music is such a 24 7 thing and because of studios, we work late, there's not a nine to five. So it's a very unstructured thing. So mm -hmm. when kids arrive, I'm, I've always said it was, it's like the love bomb and going off in your life. Yeah. <laughs> You know, everything changes, right? But I think it's so important, like like you said, taking that's so brilliant you take school holidays off because, you know, I know a lot yeah. of people who don't. And I think there are a lot of people who, you know, when, you, when your kids come along, they are the most important thing. But a lot of people also in music and in other forms have put a carry on, they're sort of obsessed with their careers. So, but my thing is like yeah. when I've, and I can understand the worry that people have because you do have less time and you do think, oh God, when am I going to have the time to do all this yeah. stuff? But my thing is like, like the, the humanity that, like, that you get from being in your family, like, because you know, anybody, who's a, 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 anybody who's a parent knows it's easier for us guys, right? Way easier for us fathers. But it's still like, yeah. it's, 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 it's it's the best thing ever, but it's also incredibly hard at times. It's so challenging, isn't it? Because yeah. when kids come yeah. along, it's like a mirror. It's like a, a, a mirror to all your yeah, yeah. fallibilities <laughs> and your shortcomings. And they're like, they're there. Yeah. And add a bit of sleep deprivation as well, which is a form of torture in yeah. some places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I'm not just I, grumpy. <laughs> I'm not just, but I really think that I think it's so important as to to bring that thing into your i think it helps you bring it into your music it brings into we bring it into what we do we might not have as much time to devote to 
our craft at this time. We, you know, they will leave home. But the thing that we get is we get it back in humanity and emotion and love. And actually, yeah. do you know what? The other yeah. thing that yeah. I got yeah. massively from my kids, and I really, I really hold it up, was they made me hear music again in a different way. So my daughter, yeah, from her room, you would get like age, age seven or eight, you get the Beatles, you get ABBA, oh. you, get, you get Bowie. You'd get, you know, I remember, I'm gonna, I'm, I remember Christmas Day about six years ago, Mamma Mia's, the film, the, you know, Mamma Mia's on. And it's a family thing. And I'm like being classic, still got the kind of taste police on from the 80s, indie head like, <laughs> Abba, <clears throat> so uncool. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but, yeah. you know, my wife, Susan's like, are you going to come and watch Mamma Mia with us all? And it's Christmas Day. Of course yeah. I am. I'm not going to be like, mm, Abba. I was crying at the end. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I, was just, I get it. Oh, my God. You know what? You know what? These are fucking brilliant pop songs. Right. And what my kids did is they took off my cool blinkers or whatever. Like, I'm only going to listen to new music. And yeah. I'm only going to listen to something that's coming off Warp or Excel. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and 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 i'm gonna listen and and it's been brilliant because it's like it's all in and it's like and i love that and yeah. i love what kids do and and <clears throat> you know kids are brilliant because they'll say they're brutal aren't they they're i don't really know if honest. you're yeah they're really honest <laughs> yeah. you're playing something they go no that's rubbish dad you know and you go yeah you're probably I think right. My mother could scare them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dad, don't play that again. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Well. well, you know, it's funny because they've also they 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 they've come they've been coming to Radiohead shows since they were little, so they know all the kind of songs that Radiohead have played, which is a lot of you know they've not they 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 actually yeah. played Pablo Honey in the car. They, I, I wasn't there. Wow. Was there. And, and they'd never heard it before. And they were laughing their heads off. They were brutal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, but yeah, it is, I think that the whole kid thing, that having family and, and making that work and being present and giving them the love, but the things yeah. you get back and that play into what we do, right? I think it's enormous. I really yeah, do. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It might exhaust us yeah, for a while. Yeah, but you need... Yeah, I mean, you you know, like, where where does inspiration come from? Yeah, you know, it, it's got to come from somewhere, and like, and it, and like, and I think that that you know, the mirror that 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 they, that they hold up to you is, you know, you see things that you realise that you that that require some exam, some cold hard examination, and that, and that, then you, and then and that that make and that even just that you go you 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 find you find things that you know that you that are that you you find emotion that you, that you that you then go and put into things yeah um and i think that's that's the that's the thing that you know i mean i, I you know i think there was a period of, um you know a, a while back when i was you know i was working and i was you know and and i felt like i was i felt like i was doing stuff without enough feeling in it without enough heart in it and and i and i kind of and I think it was. I think, I think it was just real, really realizing that the, the reason I made music in the first place was because I had feelings I wanted to. I had, I had feels that I wanted to. Um, get, I wanted to get out and to you know to to share. And, you know, to, that's how you. That, that's that's, that's what, what, what drives about. you to pick up a guitar. Or, you know, and um, and it's just and so, you know I think you know probably having kids probably made me remember that. Yeah. You know, to remember that feeling of like what it was like to want to. You know, want to pick up a guitar and make the biggest fucking noise you could, and and yeah. shout and scream, and then you know, and then, and I think that's just you know that's the, that it, it, it you know and 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 the, and the and the joy in it, and like you know the, the the moment the moment when my kids were a little bit younger than they are now, and we all we ended up having a jam session downstairs, and they were oh. sitting there singing with them. It was the, you know it's from almost almost certainly the best musical moment of my life. Yeah, you know, and, totally. and the highest accolade of all. But I, <laughs> you know, that 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 that's the that's that you know, the, the, all of us sitting in my little music room downstairs next to the hi-fi, banging a couple of bongos and playing the guitar, and, that, and like, yeah, that you know, that's 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 the stuff. That's the stuff we take with us to the grave, isn't it? Yeah, um, that's it. But, that's um, the stuff. That's a good place to stop, isn't it? The grave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Thank many. you so much for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's been so good to chat. So good. To, I know that we've got I think, I think, to I think my about. wife and my mum have both been on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, thank you. Um, yeah, well, we're going to, you know, well, I'm so looking, for, I'm looking forward to coming and demoing with you. Demoing of that guitar. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, man, no, I'm, 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 I can't wait. It's going to be fun. All right, Paul. More, more resonance, yeah. Great to speak to you, Ed. Great to speak to you, Paul. Nice one. Thank you for doing yeah, this. And, um, God.